Hey everyone, REI 360 show episode number 22, Jason and Chris as always. Our guest today is Marco from Narada Real Estate located in Orange County, California. Uh, we're going to spend a few minutes and talk to him about his turnkey real estate model, probably one of the best turnkey models that we've you know seen so far and you know I know they're popping out all over the country so uh, take a watch right now. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out REI 360 show, Chris Haddon and Jason Balin here as always from REI360.net and hardmoneybankers.com. Here with a very special guest, we are with Marco Santorelli from Norada Real Estate uh, in uh, Orange County, California. And did I pronounce your, your name right, Marco? Just want to make sure I didn't mess that up at all. It's perfect, thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks again for being on. My, pre my pleasure, I appreciate being here. So uh, first things first, would you mind uh, giving our watchers and listeners a little background on you and your history in real estate? Sure. Well, um, uh, you know, I was kind of saying um, off air here that I jumped into real estate at the age of 18 when I could first qualify for financing. So I never read a book or took a course. I just decided this is what I have to do. So I jumped into real estate and bought my first property. It was a fixer upper. So I, I fixed it, uh, uh, you know, just gutted that thing, uh, fixed it up, leased it and uh, managed it for a number of years. And it was literally textbook. Uh, I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure what I was doing, but it worked out well and the writing was on the wall. So to kind of just fast forward through time, um, I I was part of a failed dot-com, a co-founder in a dot-com company back in 2000. And uh, when the stock market crashed, our VC funding dried up, unfortunately. So I took a few years off and, and just didn't want to jump into anything because I was kind of burnt out. And then in 2003, when real estate was on fire, um, I thought, well, maybe this is really what I want to get back into. So uh, I looked around and I, caught, I got an email from Robert G. Allen in about uh, August of that year. Um, and they were having this free seminar up in California, Orange, Orange, California. So I went up and checked it out and there was about 2,000 people in this free seminar. It was a, a weekend seminar. And it was unbelievable because the information was great, but of course they were selling a package and these packages were anywhere from $15,000 to $35,000. Yet people were running to the back of the room, <laughs> credit cards in hand, ready to pay. <laughs> so, um, you know, I decided, well, what the heck, I'm going to, you know, take these boot camps and workshops and just see what happens. Um, I'm kind of glad I did because it, it was that event and those workshops that ultimately um, caused me to launch this business, Norada Real Estate Investments, back in early 2004. And again, to make a long story short, the reason I launched this business is I realized that these investors, quote unquote, who were spending literally tens of thousands of dollars going through these courses, really weren't learning enough to pull the trigger and start investing in real estate. So. I came up with a model, and I'm, I'm not the, the creator of this model, but I think I've just taken it to another level, of bringing investors completely researched, turnkey, cash-flowing investment properties in different markets that made sense. Sure. And, uh, and that's really how the business was born. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because Chris and I kind of have a, a similar uh, you know, history like that around 2004, 2005, going to some events and being like, wow, you know, there's, you know, you know, this is kind of game, game changing. And, um, you know, I, I remember kind of indulging in as much information as possible, buying some programs and, you know, with those programs in general, you know, in my opinion, you know, most of them are pretty good content and they work if you, if you follow them and you're the right person, unfortunately, as you probably know, you know, 95% of that room probably, you know, bought that program and then disappeared. But the yeah. ones like you, the ones like us that kind of took action and, and did it, you know, really made a lot out of it. And that's actually how we started as well. Um, so we're, Chris and I actually, although, you know, our primary business is on the lending side and we do acquire properties and we have a, a decent rental portfolio, we have some background in the turnkey model. Tell us a little bit about that. Do you just do turnkey properties in California or uh, I noticed on your website, it seems like you have some properties in other areas of the country. Yeah. Um, actually, I wouldn't touch California with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> um, 
Um, you know, I, I have a trade, a, literally a trademark saying is live where you want, invest where it makes sense. Uh, you know, I happen to love where I live for many reasons, although I, I, you know, I have a beef with a lot of things in California, you know, the political environment, the franchise tax board and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, um, but you can't invest in property here in California that actually makes sense. Unfortunately, you know, property values have escalated to you know the stratosphere again and what that has caused is it's created an environment where your rent to value ratios or your RV ratios are so low you know about they're about 0.4% 0.5% that's just much too low to really make sense from an investment perspective so you either have to put a very large down payment to pick up a property that will generate maybe an 8% 7 6% cap rate or um, you take that investment capital, the same investment capital, and you invest out of state in markets that do make more sense, that are not inflated or overinflated, uh, where you can leverage that investment capital into more property, where you can get a higher rate of return, where you can still get um, good cash flow or better cash flow. In fact, in most cases, it's better cash flow. Um, now, granted, maybe the appreciation potential is not as high outside of California, um, but going forward, I think that's that, that will be the case because, you know, as you guys both know, you can't go with double-digit appreciation rates for an indefinite period of time. You know, that, that just comes crashing down. And that's what we have here, you know, in, in the coastal states, not just California, but New York, New Jersey. These are what I call cyclical markets. And so they go up and down like a roller coaster. But, you know, our clients are very happy investing in other markets like in the Midwest, Kansas City, Indianapolis, down south in Memphis. Atlanta, um, the major uh, markets in Texas, uh, Birmingham, Alabama is one of our newer markets, which you know is offering some really good rates of return and properties that are you know under the hundred thousand dollar mark. So, long answer to your question, but um, but yeah, so California, no, uh, other markets, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, th that makes a lot of sense, and we have a, a similar market here where we, or maybe not similar, but. In our area here in DC Metro, we're in DC, Maryland, Virginia. Um, we have basically the whole gamut of, you know, uh, not overinflated, but you know, high price properties that are not going to cash flow for the purpose of buying and holding. Uh, and then we have where we like kind of in the middle. There's obviously rough areas too, which we stay away from, but in the middle where we get the right kind of cash flow for our formula, plus we get the moderate appre appreciation over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and your price points are very high there, from what I recall. In yeah, some areas. Yeah, I mean, it's a similar type of market as California on, you know, there, there's the A's, you know, there's the A and the B and the C types of inventory that we look at. And like Chris was saying, the A probably will appreciate over time. But unless you want to put a ton of cash into the thing, you're never going to get a return on it short term. And exactly. then, you have, and, you know, we overlap in cities like Baltimore and, you know, some other parts of like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and places like that, that, you know, you can get into these things at you know, the entry is like 30, 40 grand, but you can cash flow them at 1500 bucks a month, which those things will be that exact same price point down the road. Um, but it's just a long-term cash flow play. And then you got the B areas, which, you know, kind of work great for probably your model and our internal rental model related to, you know, you can get decent debt on it, long-term debt on it. You know, they appreciate, you know, a little bit and the cash flow is decent. Yeah, no, that's great. And Marco, let me ask you a question. Um, you did mention a couple different, areas, uh, uh, several areas where you're seeing the, the best product for the people who want to buy these properties. How do you source and manage deals in so many different markets? Well, your question is about the sourcing, not so much uh, the type of product, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, sourcing, managing jobs, you know, everything that goes into the turnkey model, the property management, what have you. Like, how does that all work? Just because it's a little bit outside, sure. of, you know, what we do. Yeah, well, I, I think you're probably asking three different questions all in, rolled in one, which is which is fine. Correct. Um, I'll work it backwards. First of all, in order to make our business model work, we have to obviously have boots on the ground. So we have to have people, a team. Um, in every market, we have um, essentially what we call partners, just to you know chalk everybody up into one circle. But these partners are people that we work with that focus on acquisition, because a lot of these properties are acquired through um, uh, uh, through auction. Um, some of them come from the MLS, although not very often. Some of them are REO departments, but a lot of them are coming from auction. 
And that's where we find we can get the properties at the best price. And so what we do is we have a criteria. We know within each market what sub-markets we want to focus on and what neighborhoods we prefer. That's important because it, it doesn't matter what market you're in, whether it's in Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., uh, or Kansas City, Missouri. You're going to have neighborhoods that you want to stay away from. You have neighborhoods that are going to be um, primarily rental markets. You're going to have neighborhoods that are going to be premium, uh, you know, homeowner-occupied areas and everything in between. So you have your criteria. You go to your auctions. You, you acquire these properties. You do some due diligence prior to. Once you've acquired the property, you go in, you write up a scope of work, you bring in your contracting crews, they do the renovation work, bring that condi- that property to like new condition um, so it stays clean, functional, and um, at that point you have it inspected to make sure there's no issues or red flags. And at that point, you know, we're the other side of the coin away from our team where we're focused on client acquisition, educating our clients, teaching them, you know, and guiding them about how to invest in real estate, what markets make sense, choosing that market, choosing the right neighborhood, doing their due diligence on the area, and then doing due diligence on the property. So the sales, marketing, client education portion is what, you know, we spend a lot of our time on, and then our teams on the ground focus on the acquisition and renovation. And that's, that's in a nutshell, is the model. Sure. Now, did they have to get – how? What do they do about funding? Do they do a short-term private or hard money loan on the front and then they get banks to take them out for long-term or do they do it in one, you know, one loan or is it just cash? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the, the, the capital comes from two sources uh, and this is true with any kind of rehabber or flipper around the country. They're either going to, they're either going to get hard money loans and or they're going to have private investors that are providing them with capital, much like a, a revol- revolving line of credit. So, um, you know, sometimes that money's cheaper, it just depends. And, and you know, I'm doing a lot of renovations in Kansas City right now. We've got nine, I personally have nine properties being renovated as or done as I speak. So, um, I, I haven't used any hard money on those nine. On those nine, I've used private capital from clients from past clients and, and real estate investors that I know. So I raise the capital and that's how we do it. So everybody's different. Um, you know, it's a combination of hard money and private capital. But um, ultimately, the, the goal is once that property is made, um, has, is fully renovated, you know, we want to either sell it retail or we're going to sell it to one of our clients that fit that market. And so if they like that property, they like that neighborhood, and that's the property for them, they're going to put it under contract. They're going to get their financing in place with a permanent lender, when it's a permanent meeting, taking out that hard money loan. And uh, they'll just end up with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage on that investment grade property, and that takes out the finance. Yeah. So, so, you, so you guys are taking ownership to these first and, you know, getting everything done and leased up or not leased up if it's not going to be a rental. So you're doing everything on the front end yourself, and then you're selling it to a turnkey client. Um, collectively, yeah, that's, that's correct. But the reason I'm asking is we've had some past experience with some folks in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a market around here, and theirs was they defined the person ahead of time that wanted the turnkey model. They yeah. put up cash or get hard money or private money to get the thing done, and then they would do a takeout loan afterwards. and um, yeah, I mean that left this business. I think that business model is obviously a lot uh, less risky because there's, you know, you're selling it on day one. You have zero liability, but at the same time, it's hard to probably get <clears throat> an influx of inventory because it's hard to find the buyers for that stuff. Yeah, I, I know a few companies that are doing that. I, you know, there there are quote unquote competitors. I, I don't consider them direct competitors, but we've had clients call us and say, yeah, I've talked to so and so or this company and that company and. I just don't feel comfortable with, you know, being the one to stick my neck out and take on the risk of, you know, ha- not knowing what property I'm going to be buying, funding it, having them renovate it, not knowing if they're going to finish renovating it, and then, you know, I'm going to hope that it's everything they, you know, sold it to be. So I don't like that model personally. Sure. I like, I mean, you're, you're, I like your model because you have control, you have, you have a lot of ability to, you know, ramp up, you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a similar to hard money related to having like private investors on the back end. It's like, I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. I know this is a good deal and I know I can get this sold and I'm going to put up the money for it. I'm going to renovate it. And I'm the expert in this space. And you know, if you want this deal, great. If not, I'm going to find someone else for it. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you guys know this. you know, you guys are really smart guys, you know, people, investors that are investing out of state, you know, sometimes it's referred to as turnkey investing, but that could be anywhere. But this out of state or out of area investment model for many people is somewhat scary. And really, that's just a psychological barrier because there's no difference um, buying a property, you know, across the street from your house or down, you know, on the other side of town from where you live or 3,000 miles away. At the end of the day, you shouldn't be managing it. At least that's my belief. You should have a professional property manager managing your property so you can live your life, spend time with family and look for more deals. So if you're, so under that scenario, it doesn't matter where your property is located. As long as it's in the right market, it's generating the cash flow and rates of return that you want, it really doesn't matter. It's just like buying stocks and mutual funds. Do you ever go and check out the company before you invest in a mutual fund? Do you, you know, are you sitting in their, their office or going to their building? I mean, more often than not, you're in California and they're in New York, and so you're investing in stocks and equities and mutual funds that you've never had any close proximity to. So the same thing with real estate, you know, buy what makes sense regardless of where it is. If it's in the U.S. and it's under professional management, it makes sense. And, and part of the reason I'm mentioning this is because back in 2004, when I was, uh, you know, on fire buying an investment property, I was traveling quite literally up to 3,000 miles away from where I live um, once or twice a month. And I was really um, knee deep. Um, you know, in, into this out-of-state investing. I was looking at and buying properties located in other states. And I, I kind of perfected that model. I've, I've, I've learned how to do my due diligence and how to do the research and how to inspect the property. And now it's just a very clearly defined checklist. Literally, it's a checklist that we give our clients and say, here, you know, we're going to hold you by the hand, but you follow along with this checklist and just check it off as we go. And so we've kind of dumbed it down. I hate to say that, but we've dumbed it down. Sure, I, I get it. Let me ask you uh, one other question. Uh, I know we're you're getting a little bit short on time. Do do you a lot of your clients repeat? You know, they buy one prop, they buy one property from you. They're like, wow, this is actually a great investment. You know, I don't have to hand. You know, it's hands off on my end. These guys are taking care of anything, managing it. I'm kind of just collecting checks, type of thing. And then do they start coming back? That was gonna yeah, be similar. Repeat. Like just a little add on to that question. Like, who is your ideal client? Like, who is who are the buyers that you're looking for? Yeah, I, um, I've got about 10 minutes just so we're, you know, on the same page. No problem. Um, the uh, ideal client is, it's kind of hard to say that there's actually an ideal client because we have everybody from what you might call a newbie. So this is someone who is just getting started in real estate. Haven't They haven't bought their first property, but they have the credit, they have the cash, they have the desire and they've been educating themselves and so they're getting started and they're they're a perfect client but they're a beginner and then on the other end of the spectrum you know we've got clients that make literally hundreds of thousands of dollars a year they're very busy c-level executives um, they already have a real estate portfolio uh, and they're looking to add on or do 1031 exchanges into other markets and so that's a very different type of client, but they're also an ideal client because we can help them just as much as we can help the beginner. Sure. Um, so now what was the other question? I'm sorry. The repeat. If, if um, a lot of your buyer clients buy multiple properties, which is right, right. Like the sorry that. first group. Okay. Yeah. You can go ahead. So, um, yeah. Uh, being a repeat client is actually fairly typical. Uh, we find that most, clients, most investors will not buy one and stop. It doesn't make sense from an investment perspective to just have a portfolio of one property. Um, so the majority of the time they're going to keep buying. They're going to buy one and two. Sometimes we have investors that will buy two in parallel simultaneously because they're on a fast track to build their portfolio. So if the lender will allow them to do it, they'll buy two at the same time and, and then just keep doing two and two and two if they can. Are they getting Fannie financing, or are they getting like local bank financing typically? And how much and how much cash are they putting down under these? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, it's a little different in the residential world, as you guys know, than the commercial world. Um, but uh, 
what we advise clients to do and what they try to do is for their first 10 properties, you know, they're definitely going to be getting conventional financing. So they'll get their first four with a 20% down, then they'll get the next six with a 25% down, and then after that they're outside of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, you know, guidelines. So at that point, they don't really have a choice but to use portfolio lenders. And we have a pool of lenders that we work with that do nothing but investment loans. So there is, at least today, um, theoretically, uh, lenders that we work with that will allow unlimited number of loans. So they don't have a cap. As long as you've got the reserves, the cash reserves, and um, uh, the credit, you know, and a, and a decent profile, they're going to keep funding you. Which yeah. is, you know, I'm sure you guys know, but a year ago you can do that. In fact, a year ago it was really hard to get financing for foreign national people outside the U.S. Today, um, I think there's two or three lenders that I can think of that will finance foreign national investors, which, you know, they don't have U.S. credit. Yep. No, and, and after they get to 10 anyways, you know, they're in a good spot. I mean, they're putting down 25% in all of them, so they have you know, at least, well, you hope at least 25% equity plus the inherited equity that they got with it. So, you know, they're in a good spot. They got cash flow coming in. Um, yeah, I mean, we do, we, we own a lot of rentals as well, but a lot of ours are just, because they're all local, you know, local line of credit, local bank um, that that have it. But yeah, it seems like you really got a good kind of grasp on your model. And yeah, we, I mean, we're familiar with the turn, with the turnkey setup. Um, you know, we, we've, got some local like business partners and stuff that have been in that business as well. And we've always kind of been attracted to it because it's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a, a sexy model and, you know, it really gives, you know, someone who maybe wouldn't consider themselves full-time real estate investor, the opportunity to invest in properties. And my guess is some of these guys that are even real estate investors, it probably makes them more sense if they're buying rentals, just go buy a turnkey rental anyways, instead of trying to build up your portfolio yourself, because, you know, as we all know, it's manageable to do one property, yourself and then as soon as you get to two it's an absolute headache and then anything more than that's unmanageable so you know in our minds you know owning 20 properties is easier than owning like one property when you have the right team and the right staff and the right you know you know formula in place yeah i think the difference is um you made some good points you know i i did a couple of podcasts on this one is the difference between an active real estate investor and a passive real estate investor you know when you're the people that we work with are certainly passive real estate investors. And what it really comes down to is time. A lot of people just don't have the time. They're busy. They don't want to roll up their sleeves and start assembling a team of people in a market and having to do the research to figure out where to buy, going to the auction, um, managing the crew. Uh, you know, they don't want to be actively involved from beginning to end. They just want something that makes sense, that they can invest their capital, get finance, and, and just move on to the next property and just keep doing that. that. That's really what a lot of people want. Unfortunately, there's, there hasn't been a lot of people servicing that industry. Although it's funny, you know, everything goes in cycles, whether it's the economy, the real estate market, um, I mean, you name it. You know, in 2005, 2006, there, I had a lot of competitors. There, just people were coming out of the woodwork. Now, granted, a lot of them were real estate agents that were trying to expand their business into the investment community, but there were a lot of competitors. And then 2006 to 2008 rolled around and they all disappeared. I mean, they just died on the vine and everybody was gone. I think there was really only about a handful of companies that survived 2008, you know, us being one of them. Now today I'm seeing that same thing happen again. There are people coming out of the woodwork trying to service this investor community. So we'll just see how long that lasts for. <laughs> We see that on the lending side too. You know, guys, guys with a little bit of money come in and you know try to undercut the market, and you know all of a sudden you know make making bad investment decisions, and yeah, <laughs> they, they'll, yeah. Get, they'll get weaned out quick. The cycles. Of yeah. <laughs> um, so, Marco, there's a good chance that our listeners and viewers could be potential buyers of yours. If uh, people want to check out what you have going on, how should they find you? Uh, well, the, the best way to find out what we're doing, what we have, and and all the free resources that we offer um, can be found on two websites. Our, our primary site where we have all our property, and by the way, these two sites link to each other. Uh, our primary website is noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A, noradarealestate.com. Uh, and then our, our podcast website is passiverealestateinvesting.com. 
and my contact information is all on there. Absolutely. Very good, Marco. Well, thanks again for being with us. It's some good information today. I think you have a very good grasp on yeah. the turnkey model, one of the, the best I've heard, frankly. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate being on your show, and I appreciate your time, and I look forward to having you on a future episode of our show. Absolutely. We'd be happy to. We appreciate it. Yeah, we'll keep in touch. Thanks. All right, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.